Okay, everybody, I think it is just about go time. Um, so we got a lot of material to uh, pack into a very small amount of time, so we will go ahead and get running here. Um, so hopefully you're here to learn about OpenStack. Um, how many people here already know something about OpenStack, maybe have it running? Yeah, a few. How many of you are developers? How many of you are developers who have written uh, using the OpenStack APIs? OK, so a few. OK, good. All right, so um, let's talk about OpenStack a little bit. So who here remembers the first time that they were asked to stand up a distributed system versus that thing that you just had to run on your desktop? That was a lot of fun, wasn't it? How about the first time that you were asked to stand up a series of distributed systems that were mostly independently developed but all sort of worked together? That was pretty easy, right? Turns out distributed systems are pretty powerful for the things that we want to do in data centers. Um, and especially when it comes to cloud computing, there's really no other way to go. Um, uh, monoliths do not work as cloud computing control planes. Um, problem is that being distributed systems, they are sometimes kind of hard to learn. Um, good thing the manuals are pretty clear though, right? So that's, that's useful, uh, especially open source manuals are always, always pretty good. Um, so sometimes uh, having a little help to make that first leap when you're getting into a fairly complex subject is, is a useful thing. Um, so where do we start? We're going to start right here today at All Things Open. Uh, so uh, if you're new to OpenStack, this is going to be a very quick primer. We're going to go through a couple of the major components. Um, just so you know, there's about 650 Git repositories in the OpenStack project now, so we're not going to go through all of them uh, in 40 minutes. But hopefully we're going to cover uh, some ground that's useful for, for the most of you. Um, and then obviously I'll be around afterwards if you want to talk uh, about more advanced topics later. So uh, my name is Mark Velker. I'm the OpenStack architect at VMware. Um, which I joined about 11 months ago after spending about 11 years at Cisco. Uh, I've been working in OpenStack since about 2011. Um, I'm a former core developer on one of the uh, Puppet OpenStack projects. Uh, I'm the founder of the local meetup group here um, and an early member of the OpenStack Foundation. Uh, I can be bribed with donuts, so if you want me to appear at birthday parties and talk about OpenStack, I will do that. Um, you just need to supply a requisite number of Krispy Kreme uh, plain donuts. So let's get started. What if I told you that OpenStack was a lot of words? Um, this is taken uh, as an excerpt from the OpenStack website. If you go to the OpenStack website today, this is what you're going to see. Uh, it's a lot of words. I won't try to read them all out to you out loud. Uh, but it kind of gives you an idea of what it actually is. Um, it's early in the morning for especially those of you who are visiting us from the West Coast. So this probably is not so useful for you. So let's rephrase that a little bit. Basically, OpenStack is software to run cloud services. So that's things like compute, like storage, like networking. Uh, there's a lot of other things you can put on top of it. There's databases, there's uh, big data processing. All those things uh, are software at some point. And OpenStack provides that software to you so that you can build uh, clouds. Uh, and it also, very importantly, is the community behind that software. And I'll talk a little bit about why the community is actually pretty important for OpenStack a little bit later on. Um, and it's actually one of the, the largest open source communities that I've ever really been a part of. Uh, which is pretty, pretty phenomenal. A little bit of early history. Um, OpenStack was founded in 2010 by Rackspace, NASA, and some friends. Uh, NASA, uh, you may have heard from, from Mr. McKenty, was working on a uh, compute controller uh, for the NASA Nebula Cloud, um, which they dubbed Nova. Uh, and Rackspace, around the same time, was working on an object storage controller, uh, which they called Swift. Um, they kind of uh, heard about each other's projects, decided that they were interesting uh, and complementary, and got together and founded this thing called OpenStack. A few days ago, uh, we released the 12th version of OpenStack. Um, just went live a few days ago. If you go to the OpenStack.org website, you'll see a big splash page at the top talking about the new Liberty release. Um, we, just for uh, background, we, we name our releases in alphabetical order after a, a, a town or a street uh, or some locale near where the design summit for that thing took place. Uh, so Liberty is actually a town in Canada. Uh, and we had our last design summit in Vancouver. Um, so the project follows a six month release cycle. Uh, in the early days, we actually moved even faster than that. Uh, we were moving at about a, I guess a three month cadence early on. Um, I can't run that fast anymore, so I'm glad that we moved to a six month cycle. Um, hundreds of companies, thousands of people contributed just in the last release alone. Uh, we had contributions from almost 2,000 people to OpenStack projects. Uh, and, and those represent about 164 different organizations. Uh, and those are just the ones that are actually contributing code. There are a lot more people who are contributing things like bug fixes, 
uh, or sorry, bugs, uh, bug reports, uh, who are contributing user stories, uh, who are contributing feedback to the developers. So it's a pretty large, pretty global uh, community. Um, it's probably going to take a lot of time if I tried to go through all the companies that are in that ecosystem now. So I thought maybe the easiest thing to do um, would be to try to phrase it in terms of which companies are not actively involved in the OpenStack ecosystem right now. And that's a pretty short slide. Um, there's really only about one. Uh, almost every other company that you've seen uh, in the IT space, uh, if you are buying hardware from a company, uh, if you are buying cloud services from a company, they're probably involved in the OpenStack ecosystem somehow. That includes, for example, Google and Microsoft. Uh, both those uh, companies have teams that are actually contributing to OpenStack. Uh, that includes VMware, my employer. Uh, that includes um, uh, companies like Rackspace that have been doing this for a while. Uh, that includes storage vendors, networking vendors, uh, computer uh, makers, uh, all across the board. So let's talk a little bit about how OpenStack is structured. Um, OpenStack is currently governed by the OpenStack Foundation. Uh, that was founded a couple years after the project actually began uh, as sort of a nonprofit entity that would sort of house um, uh, strategic leadership for, for uh, OpenStack going forward. Uh, membership is free for individuals, so feel free to head on over to OpenStack.org and sign yourself up. Um, there are also platinum, gold, and corporate memberships uh, that are paid if your company is interested in becoming a part of that ecosystem. Um, there's a board of directors for the OpenStack Foundation. It is comprised of all eight of the platinum members, uh, represented from each of them. Uh, some of the gold members, they get another eight seats among all the different uh, gold members. I think there's, uh, gosh, about a little over a dozen or maybe about 20 or so gold members now. Um, and then there are generally elected members as well that are, are uh, elected uh, in a general election among all the uh, members of the, the foundation. Um, the foundation's job is to provide strategic and financial oversight. Um, and so they do things like they manage the OpenStack brand, they manage the logo, uh, they help put on uh, OpenStack design summits. Um, uh, once a year, they send me some money so I can buy beer uh, for our local meetup group uh, to celebrate OpenStack's birthday. Um, and they do outreach programs and all those other kinds of, of, of cool things. Um, what the OpenStack Foundation actually does not govern is the code itself. Um, which is uh, kind of a good thing if you consider um, the makeup of the board that I just talked about. Um, so you can't really buy your way into the OpenStack code base necessarily, right? Um, that all goes through um, code reviews and is ultimately governed by the technical committee. So the technical committee is a uh, committee of uh, sort of senior or trusted members of the, of the OpenStack community who are developers themselves in most cases. Uh, and they provide technical leadership uh, for OpenStack as a whole. So they're sort of the final technical authority uh, when conflicts arise or when uh, choices need to be made about something in, in the OpenStack community. Um, generally speaking, uh, this is not going to be like a group that goes in and reviews every piece of code and makes the final yes or no. Um, there's really no need for a very small committee of people to do that. That happens organically in the projects themselves. Uh, and that's governed by um, the individual project teams. Uh, but their job is really to enforce kind of OpenStack's ideals and set sort of very large, uh, broad scale uh, technical direction. Uh, and they are all directly elected by active contributors to the project. Uh, so every, every six months, uh, I get a ballot in the mail to uh, elect, uh, sorry, once every year, I get a, a ballot in the mail to elect um, uh, members to the TC uh, because I'm an active technical contributor to the project. Um, so I've contributed code upstream, and therefore I get to help pick who governs that process. Um, there's also project team leaders. Uh, for each project within the OpenStack ecosystem, there's going to be a project team lead. Um, the name has changed a little bit over time. Uh, so you'll see this referred to as project technical leaders sometimes. Uh, we call them team leads now. Uh, their job is, is to kind of be the, the chief steward of that individual project. Uh, below, they also have a, a team of uh, core contributors uh, to each project. Uh, those are the guys who can actually merge your patch when you submit it. Uh, and those uh, are all uh, sort of organically chosen uh, by the, the project teams themselves as well. Uh, very importantly, there's also something called a user committee. Um, so in OpenStack, um, in, in the early days, OpenStack was very, very developer-centric. Uh, and users, end users kind of didn't have a real good voice in the community. So the user committee is actually designed to help fix that problem. They do things like run an annual survey of who's deploying what uh, in OpenStack so that we get some feedback about what's going well, what things are people using, uh, and so on and so forth. And they're sort of the general body that represents uh, users uh, of, of OpenStack. Uh, before both the technical committee and the board of directors. Um, so that's a lot of structure, it's a lot of code, it's a lot of projects, uh, and at the end of the day, it is all designed to give you power. Uh, and the idea is that you can build a cloud out of the stuff that you want 
and there's a whole lot of different stuff that you can put under the hood and a whole lot of different options that you can enable that meets your needs. So this isn't a very prescriptive project. It is a project that uh, is very, very flexible. Um, if you look at the, if you count the total number of config options just in the core projects, I think it's a couple thousand now. Um, so it's a pretty flexible project. Um, that means you can do a whole lot of stuff with it. Um, and if you want to, you can also go buy a project that somebody has built out of this. So uh, companies like mine will happily give you some bits to run in your data center. They're a little more prescriptive. Um, and um, there are also public clouds uh, built on OpenSAC. There are managed services built on OpenSAC. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to consume uh, OpenSAC. Participation in the project, um, this is pretty t standard stuff. Uh, it's a very IRC-centric project, uh, so a lot of discussions going on in uh, IRC every day. There's a link in the slides here. I'll put these up on slideshow later. You can go click and figure out where to go for, for all that. Um, there's a number of mailing lists, um, the most active of which are probably the OpenStack mailing lists, which is kind of Q&A uh, for people that are using OpenStack, uh, and then obviously the development list as well. Uh, the OpenStack dev list is um, uh, a source of much pain for my email quotas. Um, the code is, is stored in Git. Uh, we host our own Garrett uh, uh, in the OpenStack infrastructure. Uh, that's where all our code reviews take place in the community. Uh, that is mirrored out to GitHub as well uh, for people that like to consume via GitHub, uh, kind of a mildly popular platform for consuming code. Uh, we store bugs in Launchpad, uh, and there's uh, lots of documentation in OpenStack wikis as well. We generally have uh, two annual design summits and conferences. Uh, one for uh, each release. I mentioned that we have a six month uh, release cadence. So about every six months we get together uh, just after we've released a version of code and figure out what we're gonna do for the next six months. Um, I'm actually leaving for Tokyo on Saturday to go attend the next one of those. Um, uh, boy, that's gonna be a long flight in economy class. Um, the next one is in Austin, uh, so a little closer to home. If you're interested in, in uh, going to a design summit, that may be a pretty accessible one, um, and you won't have to pay thousands of dollars for airfare. Uh, and then uh, next fall, we'll be out in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, I have this theory that any project that gets large enough or any company that gets large enough eventually hosts a conference in, in Barcelona. Um, there's a welcome guide as well. If you're brand new to OpenSAC, uh, go get these slides, click that link, uh, or you can find it on the OpenSAC.org website. It's pretty prominently displayed uh, in the community section. Um, and that's kind of a, a general uh, welcome to OpenSAC. Here's how to get started guide. Um, if you're interested in trying out OpenSAC as an end user, uh, there's a community site called tristack.org. Um, and that's where you can actually go sign up for a free account. You get a few days of uh, time on a real live OpenSAC cloud running uh, the Kilo release currently, I think. Uh, I'm not sure what the, the upgrade cycle for Liberty is looking like for that. Um, but that'll give you some time to actually go try out OpenSAC uh, without actually having to uh, do anything in your own servers or your own computers or your, even your own laptop. Uh, if you're like me, uh, you probably actually want something on your laptop that you can play around with and really break things and go into the hood and look at the code. Um, so a decent way to uh, start with that is to go look at uh, DevStack, uh, which is our uh, sort of glorified shell script that installs a bunch of OpenStack components right on your laptop, uh, kind of all in one machine so that you can uh, go play with things and break things. Um, and generally, you can tell DevStack to pull the very latest code, uh, or you can tell it to pull some older, more stable branch if that's uh, more, more to your liking. Um, so what are people using it for? Um, I mentioned that the uh, user committee has a survey uh, every six months, um, and this is some data from, from uh, one of the more recent ones of those. Um, just to give you kind of an idea of like workloads that people are running on this today, it's certainly um, kind of a hard area to capture. Um, you'll, you'll notice that like number three there is it's up to the user. Um, so I built a cloud and some teams are gonna go run some stuff on it and I don't really know what they are and I don't really care uh, because that's what tendency does. Um, I don't have to care, right? Uh, all I have to do is provide them the platform. Uh, but just to give you an idea, um, web apps are really popular, uh, CI CD systems are really popular, um, application development, a uh, great platform for that because it's really elastic, disposable resources, right? Uh, I can start by spinning up VMs today, I can spin them down tomorrow, uh, and um, you know how that works in, in cloud. Okay, so um, hundreds of projects available, uh, pretty flexible platform, right? Um, so you get to choose which projects you deploy. Um, there's a whole lot of these, uh, and some, some are very new. Uh, there are some projects that are less than six months old in OpenStack's ecosystem, and there are others that are uh, going on five years now. Um, so there's a whole different range of, of, of options out there for you, depending on what you're trying to do with your cloud. So let's talk about a few of them. Um, I obviously don't have time to do all of them today, um, so we'll talk about uh, some of the ones that are more popular. Uh, again, this comes from the, the OpenStack user survey, and you can kind of see at the top there, there's sort of a division there where um, uh, usage tends to, tends to fall off among users who are actually responding to the survey. Um, 
So some of the ones that are, that are up top there are the ones that have been around for uh, quite some time. Uh, and we'll talk mostly about those today. Uh, and again, if you have questions about other Intact projects, come find me afterwards and we'll, we'll try to uh, talk a little bit more about those. So let's start off with a basic look at the software. Um, this diagram is, is a little bit old um, and there's more stuff that would kind of fit the picture now, but I think it's a useful starting point for a 101 session um, to kind of give you an idea of, of what's out there. Um, so if we look uh, at the very first two components that we talked about earlier on, uh, we mentioned that NASA had a com compute controller uh, and Rackspace had an object storage controller. Uh, those two things are called Nova and Swift. Uh, so those were kind of the original two, two pieces of the pie. Uh, shortly after that, a whole bunch of other stuff came around. Uh, we got a GUI, uh, so you can go into a web browser and point and click and not have to actually know the APIs because you can use a mouse better than you can use an API maybe, um, if you haven't learned the API yet. Um, that's called Horizon. Um, there's an identity service called Keystone, uh, which is what takes care of authentication and authorization and um, telling you who, who can do what. Uh, there's uh, a block storage uh, platform called Cinder. Uh, so this is the thing that allows you to touch, uh, attach uh, block storage volumes to those instances once you've spun them up. Uh, and there's also a networking service called Neutron. Um, past that, there's a whole bunch more projects that have kind of moved into more mainstream usage in the past uh, year or two. Um, so I've listed a few of those at the bottom. There's a database uh, service. There's a data processing service, which is kind of like Hadoop as a service, uh, as some people would put it. Uh, there's an orchestration service, there's a telemetry service, uh, and then there's just sort of like a whole bunch more stuff that I probably couldn't possibly fit on this slide. Um, so if you think about a cloudy offering, uh, there's probably some parallel for that in the OpenStack ecosystem. So if you're new to OpenStack, sometimes uh, you're not new to cloud computing in general, and it's useful to think about uh, how these compare to some of the offerings from other platforms like, say, AWS. Um, I don't have time to go through like Azure and Google Cloud as well, so we'll, we'll pick one uh, and roll with that. Um, so these are kind of the, the equivalents for those projects uh, out in the Amazon world. Uh, so there's a management console that's kind of equivalent to Horizon, our GUI. Uh, there's uh, the EC2 service in Amazon, pretty equivalent to our compute controller called Nova. Um, so you can kind of see all the, the parallels that are out there. Um, you'll also notice that there are a few things that there aren't really good parallels for in every ecosystem. Um, so in OpenStack, for example, we have Glance, which is an image service. Um, that's where I upload images that I want to uh, turn into virtual machines later on. Um, there's not an exact correlation for that in Amazon because they sort of lump that in with their compute service, right? Um, so there's some things that are just a little bit um, semantically, if you like, different uh, between different clouds out there. Uh, so no big surprise, but uh, that should uh, uh, give you an idea of, of some of the parallels between the OpenStack world uh, and other uh, ecosystems that are out there. Um, before we go into technical details about all these projects, let's talk a little bit about DEF Core. Um, Chris Hodge, who's here in the room somewhere at the back, uh, is actually going to give a whole talk about this uh, next, uh, uh, at this very stage. Uh, so I won't steal his thunder too much. But um, because I mentioned that there are so many different projects uh, in OpenStack, uh, and there are all kinds of nerd knobs that you can turn to make your, your cloud behave different ways, even if you're only running a subset of those components, um, one of the things that OpenStack's been very concerned with lately is having interoperable products. Uh, so as an end consumer of, a, of an OpenStack product, I'd like to know maybe that um, if I get a um, cloud product from, I don't know, uh, Red Hat or VMware or uh, Ubuntu, um, then if I change my mind and want to run a different OpenStack later on, or maybe I want to go to a public cloud later on and share workloads between the two, I want some level of interoperability between those things. I want to know that if an API call works down here, it also works over here. Um, so the OpenStack community is, has begun to address that uh, in the past year or so uh, with a program uh, called the DEF Core Committee. Um, and basically the DEF Core Committee's job is to figure out what is sort of the core stuff in OpenStack that consumers would logically expect to work in all places. Um, any product that bears the OpenStack logo should really support some core set of functionality that's uh, going to work no matter where you are uh, and whose product you use. Um, so its job is basically to come up with what we call guidelines, uh, and those are uh, sort of lists of uh, capabilities that an OpenStack product must have if it's going to call itself OpenStack, uh, and then a list of tests that it must pass in order to prove that it actually supports those capabilities. Um, those guidelines also include designated sections of the OpenStack code that say if you offer this capability, you've actually got to do it with OpenStack code. Um, so you know that as a consumer, if you are um, buying a product um, that meets all these uh, capabilities and passes all those tests, um, that somebody hasn't actually, you know, rewritten the thing in Java. Um, all right, so let's go through uh, some of the components in OpenStack. Um, how am I doing on time? Pretty good. 
Okay, uh, we'll go through um, sort of some of the more popular components here. Uh, I'll give a very, very brief kind of one slide look at each one just to give you an idea of what the capabilities of those things are um, and what they abstract. So we'll start with Keystone, which is the um, authentication service. Um, so basically, Keystone's job is it's the central service for authentica authentication and authorization. Uh, and it also provides a service catalog. Um, so basically, this is where you start uh, when you start interacting with an OpenSci Cloud. The very first thing you do if you go to Horizon or if you issue an API call is you have to log in. Uh, you have to tell OpenSci who you are. Uh, and that's the service that actually takes care of doing that. Um, it abstracts various backend authentication services, among other things. Um, there's, there's a little more nuance to it, but that's kind of the one that, that people pick up on most easily. Um, you can keep authentication records in a plain old SQL database. Uh, in my world, where I work with a lot of enterprise customers lately, um, it's usually uh, an Active Directory or an LDAP backend. Um, so you're not sort of um, necessarily putting, putting uh, brand new authentication services in, you're just abstracting them uh, on some other service on the backend. Um, uses a bearer token model, uh, so basically clients are assigned a token which they then present to other services. Uh, so I get a token from the Keystone service after I successfully give it a username and password, uh, and then I give that token to Keystone or, or, sorry, to Nova or Neutron or whatever else that I want to do things for me. Um, those things have a life cycle, they expire, they can be revoked, uh, all, those, all those things. Uh, there are multiple token types out there now. Um, some of these will probably go away in the future um, as, as we move on to, to newer and better things. Uh, sort of the original token format was the UID uh, format, which is basically just a big long string of, of characters, um, uh, randomly generated, basically. Uh, we also have PKI certificates. Uh, so these are um, PKI signed um, tokens um, that you can actually authenticate offline. Uh, there's also sort of a uh, secondary format called PKIZ, which is basically a compressed version of that. Um, and that one's actually pretty popular out in the wild right now. Um, there's a very uh, sort of a newer one uh, called Fernet tokens, which actually uses uh, asymmetric encryption, uh, which is uh, kind of becoming the, the new, new rage. Um, other interesting things about Keystone, you can actually federate Keystone. Um, so if I have multiple clouds, uh, I can actually have one cloud authenticate against another, uh, essentially. So I have Keystone talking to uh, another Keystone um, to authenticate users via things like standalone assertions. Uh, again, lots more nuance in there, but uh, we're, we're sort of short on time. Um, so since there are a lot of developers in the room, I've often found that a good way to describe uh, the capabilities of a cloud service is to describe some of the primitives that they have. Um, so if you're a developer, you can kind of uh, look at some of the primitives that are out there and see, okay, uh, tokens. I can create tokens, I can update them, I can delete them, uh, do all those things with them. Um, and in some cases, it's not the full CRUD stack, but uh, just to give you an idea of some of the, some of the primitives that exist in Keystone, uh, you have things like tokens, services, endpoints. I mentioned that service catalog earlier, so I can basically get a list of um, where all the where Nova lives, where Neutron lives, how I interact with them, where I send my API request. Uh, domains, projects, groups, credentials, uh, roles, policies, uh, kind of all that identity-centric stuff. Okay, um, so let's talk about Glance. Uh, Glance is the image service. So after I've successfully logged into a cloud for the first time, uh, probably the next thing I want to do is upload an image that I will then uh, turn into an instance. Uh, so maybe I want to upload uh, a Red Hat image or an Ubuntu image or a CoreOS image or uh, whatever else. Uh, Glance is a service that does that. Um, so its job is basically to house virtual machine images that can later be launched as instances. Uh, it abstracts various image containers and disk formats. Glance can accept a whole bunch of different kinds of them. Um, the sort of caveat here is that doesn't mean that we can magically make any image format work with any hypervisor uh, at the end of the day. Uh, there are some ways to do conversion. There's even talk of, of uh, doing more advanced uh, inline conversion upstream. Um, but uh, what, uh, what images you want to actually upload into Glance um, are probably a little bit dependent on the, the underpinnings of the platform today. Uh, so for example, if, if uh, VMware is the hypervisor underneath the hood, um, you probably want to use a VMDK. Uh, if uh, KVM is the underpinning for your cloud, you probably want to use QCAL, uh, unless you're running Ceph, in which case you probably want a raw image. So uh, there is some nuance there. Um, and that is actually, uh, there's, there's kind of an interesting thing going on in the OpenSci community right now where we're trying to make those capabilities a little bit more discoverable to end users uh, so that you don't even actually have to go to a cloud provider and read its documentation about which image formats it supports. You can basically just make an API call and it will say, you know, these are the, the image formats that I support. Um, might even tell you these are the ones I really prefer. Uh, so uh, there's kind of, kind of some good conversations about that going on now. Um, multiple storage backends for this as well. Uh, you can put them uh, straight on a disk in a file. You can put them into a VMDK. You can put them into a uh, Swift. Uh, you can put them into Ceph. Uh, lots of different uh, possible backends. Primitives. Uh, so things that uh, you can do operations on with Glance. Uh, images, obviously. 
Uh, there's also some metadata associated with those images, some tags associated with those, uh, and there's also tasks as well. Uh, so this is basically a task workflow where I can, uh, as a cloud provider, I can define a set of tasks that happen when I want to, say, import an image from the outside world, uh, which might involve things like running it through some security procedures uh, before I actually publish it into my cloud. <coughs> Nova, the compute controller. Um, so this is kind of, kind of one of the granddaddies of them all uh, since it's been there for a while, uh, and it's one of the ones that most people think of when they, they talk about it in SAC. So basically, this is what takes care of launching VMs uh, and then deleting them, uh, running them, keeping track of them, where they are, uh, picking what hypervisors they actually land on in that big pool of abstracted hardware, uh, scheduling them, uh, doing all those things. That's all, all Nova stuff. Um, so think loosely Amazon EC2 here, right? Um, also takes care of some of the plugging services. Uh, it doesn't really do me a lot of good to have a VM unless I can actually get to it somehow, right? So I probably want a console, or I probably want it to plug it into a network so I can SSH into it. Uh, I probably want to inject key pairs into it so I can uh, 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 do that SSH call. Um, Nova takes care of a lot of that stuff as well. Um, so its job is basically to abstract hypervisors. Uh, in most cases, if I go to a public cloud, I don't actually know what hypervisor is running under the hood, uh, unless I've read their, their uh, news releases about it. Um, and uh, pools of computer hardware, obviously, as well. Uh, there's a bunch of servers that I don't necessarily even have to see as an end user of an open site cloud. They're just in a data center somewhere. I don't know how many they are. Uh, in most cases, I don't even know uh, what the hardware looks like. I'm uh, just uh, getting virtual machines off of it. Um, so most operations here uh, happen to be a REST call, uh, a CLI client, or a few clicks on the Horizon portal. That's true of pretty much every open stack component, right? Um, at the end of the day, those CLIs uh, and the Horizon uh, uh, web GUI itself, they're all just making API requests, right? So uh, grab your packet sniffer and, and go look at what API calls they're making if, you, if you're curious. Um, a few high-level features. Uh, most hypervisors supported. I mentioned uh, Microsoft is active uh, in OpenStack. That's one of the things that they do is to actually support Hyper-V. Uh, so you can use VMware, you can use Hyper-V, you can use KVM, you can use Kimu, you can use uh, some of the containers, uh, LXC. Uh, all those things are, are, are supported. Um, it's a distributed architecture, mostly asynchronous, um, public REST API. Uh, there's an SQL backend, uh, also true of most, most OpenStack services. Uh, we keep some, some data in the backend for keeping track of things so that, uh, you know, we have state stored somewhere. Uh, and we use AMPQ for RPC calls. Um, not strictly true. There are some other message breakers you can use, but uh, the vast majority of the world use, uses RabbitMQ for this. A um, few things that it supports, uh, there's security groups. Uh, and there's also several different means of sort of uh, segregating resources within your cloud. Um, so if you go use Amazon today, you know that uh, you can use the US East region. You can use the US West region. There's a region in Brazil. There's a region in Europe. Uh, you can do those same sorts of things with, with OpenStack. Uh, there's lots of different ways to slice and dice com compute ca capacity. Um, there's things called host aggregates, which basically um, allow an administrator to tag a set of uh, uh, backend servers with certain attributes. Uh, so maybe I say, this is a set of servers that have SSD disks, or this is a set that has um, really awesome GPUs, uh, or these are ones that have um, 10 gigabit Ethernet uh, cards. Um, and then uh, when, when my uh, clients are uh, launching an instance, they can say, I would like to have uh, a virtual machine that has access to an SSD or a GPU. Uh, and uh, the scheduler will then take care of matching those two requirements and putting, putting things in, in logical places. Um, there's also availability zones, pretty overloaded term uh, these days. Uh, a lot of people still use these for um, sort of separating failure zones. Uh, so maybe if I have two different availability zones within my cloud, uh, then those sets of machines are going to be on different uh, sets of uh, external network connectivity, different power supplies, uh, different racks, different cooling, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, just basically a way of providing some, some uh, physical isolation of those, those machines. Uh, regions, um, pretty much the same concept that you see elsewhere. Um, you can run geographically dispersed regions. Uh, we actually have people that run uh, regions within the same data center as well. Um, so again, just another, another way to slice and dice your cloud. Um, one handy thing that uh, regions are used for pretty frequently is offering uh, different computing underpinnings as well. Uh, so I might have a region of KVM capacity and a region of VMware capacity uh, and a region of Hyper-V capacity in my same cloud. Uh, there's also something called cells, uh, which I won't go into because it's kind of a long story. <laughs> but you can talk to me later about that. Uh, primitives, there are flavors. Uh, so um, this basically allows you to say, I want uh, an image that has certain characteristics, uh, say a certain amount of RAM, CPU, whatever, uh, ephemeral disk, those kinds of things. Uh, servers, obviously. Um, I want to spin up a, a quote unquote server that really translates to a VM. Um, uh, key pairs, uh, so that I can get into those things. Uh, there are quotas, uh, and there are uh, things like host aggregates and availability zones as well. 
Neutron, the network controller. Um, so basically, Neutron's job is to provide tenants, not administrators necessarily, but tenants uh, with the ability to create isolated or shared L2 and L3 virtual networks, uh, and then be able to do things like route in between them. Um, this was actually a pretty cool thing when it got started because it wasn't uh, a thing that a lot of people had thought about before. Generally, um, when people were used to asking their IT department for VMs in the past, um, they got a VLAN that the IT department had already picked and they didn't really have much say in the matter. Um, and if they wanted to change that network topology, um, there was sort of a long list of paperwork you had to go through in order to convince people that they should do that for you. Um, in OpenStack, things are a little different. Um, with Neutron, you can actually have tenants define their own networks, uh, define their own subnets. Um, they don't even have to worry about the IP addresses overlapping because Neutron supports overlapping IP addresses. Um, so within those, those isolated networks, you can actually have uh, two different tenants using exactly the same IP addresses, and then they uh, go through an app to get to the outside world and uh, don't have to worry about uh, stepping on each other's toes uh, in that way. Um, abstracts various networking backends. There's a lot of different ways to build networks in OpenStack, as it turns out. Um, uh, you can use SBN controllers. Um, you know, my employer makes one. Um, you can use physical switches. My former employer makes a lot of those. Um, there are dozens of backend plugins. Uh, some are open source, some are proprietary. There's always, uh, pretty much for any of these uh, OpenStack components, there's always a, uh, at least one uh, open source reference implementation. In our case, uh, that's uh, typically thought of as either uh, OpenVSwitch or Linux Bridge. Um, and you can use that with a variety of different um, tunneling protocols as well. You can use uh, VLANs, you can use uh, VXLANs, uh, you can use GRE tunnels, uh, and so forth. Um, supports IPv4 and IPv6, although that's a little dependent on the plugin. Not all plugins support IPv6. Um, so, for example, some uh, SDM platforms still don't support IPv6 today. Um, so, uh, if you're interested in v6, just uh, do your homework before you pick a, pick a network. Um, interestingly, uh, Neutron has gotten so big and it received so much attention that it's transformed itself over the past year or so into what we call a stadium project, uh, which is basically the uh, Neutron core has sort of set up sub teams within the project to focus on individual areas because the thing is so darn big uh, and there's so many different things you might want to do with networks uh, that it's really hard for one small set of people to focus on all that stuff. Um, I think this is a great move uh, because networks, as it turns out, are pretty diverse things. Um, it's not just L2 and L3 connectivity anymore. People want to do things like have VPN as a service. They want to have load balancing as a service. They want to have firewall as a service. Um, all of these sorts of um, higher level abstractions that are, are sort of uh, very different disciplines within the networking field. Um, so useful thing that they've done. Some of the primitives, uh, pretty much what you'd expect. Um, it, from the sort of lens of L2, L3 connectivity, you have uh, basically networks. Uh, networks have ports on them. Uh, and then you would plug VIFs uh, or virtual interfaces from your servers into those virtual ports. Um, so with an API call, you're essentially now running a Cat5 cable between two things, uh, a switch and a, a server. Um, there's routers, there's uh, other stuff. Uh, I mentioned uh, the sort of a, on the lower half of the list there are some of the things that come from some of the L4 through L7 services. Um, these ones are taken from the load balancing of the service. You'll have things like virtual IP addresses, health monitors, pools, members, just like you would on uh, if you're setting up a physical load balancer in your data center. Uh, so pretty, pretty straightforward primitives. Um, object storage. Uh, Swift's job is basically to provide highly mobile, distributed, eventually consistent object storage. Uh, objects, in this case, generally people think of this as files. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a file in a particular format, but a thing, a, a bunch of bits uh, that together make a, an object or a file. Um, interestingly, Swift is one of those components that uh, not only can be run completely independently of the rest of OpenStack, but often actually is. Um, especially in the early days, there were a lot of people who actually just cared about the, the object storage piece. Uh, so they would stand up Swift uh, separately of, of everything else. Uh, we even, uh, I know that there are some, some clouds out there that use Swift for their object storage and other things to do their compute. Um, so it's kind of, kind of interesting in that regard. Um, that said, it does have integration with everything else. So you can use Keystone to authenticate against Swift uh, and, and so forth. Um, optimized around durability and availability. Um, actually has one of the most long-lived APIs in all of OpenStack. It's still on V1 five years later. Um, so if you're interested in API stability, have I got a project for you. Um, other projects, just to give you an idea, uh, that are younger than that are now on the, their third major rev of their API. Uh, so uh, it's, it's uh, an interesting one for, for API stability. Uh, similar in some respects to HDFS or, or S3, there, there's kind of some parallels to be drawn here. Um, essentially, it's a replication service, so I put an object into Swift, and it will replicate it out to at least, usually, three different servers uh, in that back end. Uh, so that if a rack fails, if a server fails, if a hard drive fails, I haven't lost the data, right? Because it's replicated to other, other parts of the, of the data center, uh, just like you would with something like HDFS. Primitives here, uh, very simple. Accounts, containers, objects, and that's more or less it. 
Um, so containers, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Objects uh, are the things that you're going to put in there, uh, and then accounts. Um, Cinder is the block storage service. Um, so this is what provides uh, persistent block storage volumes. So when you spin up an instance in OpenStack, just like in most cloud services, if you terminate that instance, everything that was on the hard disk goes away. Right? It's gone. Poof. It's ephemeral disk. Uh, if you want to actually persist data, uh, like say if you're running a database that has data in it that you actually care about, um, you probably want to attach a persistent volume to it. Uh, in Amazon, you do that with, with S3. Uh, in, in our case, you're going to do that with Cinder. Um, this was originally part of Nova itself and then was split out in a later release to allow it to evolve independently. Uh, still some pretty, pretty strong ties there. Uh, dozens of drivers on the back ends. It, pretty much if there's a storage vendor out there, they probably have an OpenStack plugin for you. Uh, and volumes appear in instances, uh, basically just like a, a virtual hard drive. Uh, primitives, uh, volumes, backups, snapshots, uh, and some other stuff. Okay, so we're running uh, close to the edge of time here, uh, so I'm going to try to wrap up very quickly. There's a whole lot of other stuff that we can't possibly cover in 40 minutes today. <coughs> um, just to give you an ideal, idea for some of the other ways to get involved in OpenStack, there's documentation, which we actually treat as code and review in Garrett. Um, so uh, interesting way to, to do docs. Um, there's continuous integration infrastructure, there's client libraries, there's uh, Tempest, which is our integration test harness, um, bunches of other stuff out there. Uh, and then sort of at the bottom there, there's a bunch of other services that we don't really have time to talk about today as well. Uh, I mentioned that there's around 600 Git repos out there, um, and those are some of the other, other services that uh, you can get through, through OpenStack and, and contribute to. Um, we're just about out of time, but I think we might have time for a question or two. So if folks have those, I'm happy to take them, and if not, then you can find me out in the hall. Um, so there, there are various shops out there that do uh, OpenStack development. Um, like I know uh, Mirantis is pretty, pretty coin operated uh, at the risk of, uh, that's not a dig really. <laughs> uh, but they do a lot of, a lot of, a lot of integration work. Um, but there's other, other vendors out there in the ecosystem as well. Um, and there is some support for like SRIOV and those kind of things already in OpenStack. Um, so it's, it's definitely here that there's some interest in it as well. Um, I think the CERN guys were doing some work with GPUs as well. Anybody else? They will be. Uh, so I'll put them up on SlideShare, and uh, ATO usually gets them up within about two weeks or so as well on their website. OK, I think we're about out of time. Um, that's my Twitter handle. If uh, you see something here that was egregiously wrong or you just want to copy the slides later, uh, ping me, and I'll make sure that you get the links. Uh, and I'll tweet out that link later as well. Thanks. <laughs>